Welcome to the exam room live brought to you by the physicians committee. Hi, I am the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll, and this is the healthiest half hour anywhere online today. Appreciate you joining us right here on Facebook and on YouTube. Big show on tap to wrap up the week. Dr. Neil Barnard will be here with us to take a look at a new study examining whether children with COVID-19 are actually more infectious than adults. Dr. Barnard, this is a really interesting study we're going to be diving into in just a little bit. It is an eye-opener, Chuck. And I understand that the findings here have no bearing on whether or not the child themselves is actually displaying symptoms. So stick around for that. Plus, we're going to be opening up the doctor's mailbag. So if you do have a question for Dr. Barnard, go ahead and post that right now in the comments section, or you can tweet that to us using the hashtag exam room live. And then in health headlines, as if that wasn't enough, tomorrow is World Plant Milk Day. We're going to be celebrating with an important epiphany about obesity from a leading nutritionist in the UK. So what does she have to say? We'll tell you in just a little bit. Indeed, it is a big show for this Feel Good Friday, and I know a lot of you are feeling good about my next guest. He is the first guest today, and he is a megastar who went from being a hardcore carnivore to a plant-based eater with a heart of gold. Millions will recognize him as the host of popular Spanish-speaking versions of game shows like The Family Feud and The Price is Right and The Wall, and now he is the host of his own podcast called Marco. His passion for entertaining only matched by his compassion for animals, and tomorrow he will be helping thousands of native Spanish speakers take the vegan plunge and take control of your health. With that, we welcome Marco Antonio Rahil to the exam room live. Marco, thank you so very much for joining us, my friend. Thank you, Chuck. Thank you for having me here. I'm glad. My first question to you is one that I've always wanted to ask a game show host, and that is, that is such a niche career. I mean, that is as unique as being a pitch man for infomercials. So how in the world did you get involved with that? I grew up watching game shows. I was raised, born and raised in Tijuana, next to the border of San Diego, obviously. And uh, surely enough, I grew up watching Bob Barker doing The Price is Right and Richard Dawson doing The Price, uh, the Family Feud. And I would watch game shows. That's, that's how I learned English, actually, watching game shows. So then later I became a radio DJ, from radio DJ to local TV host, local TV host, national radio, national TV. And then, then... Uh, Televisa, which is the number one network in Mexico, decided to bring in The Price is Right. And there I was, and I knew the show, like the palm of my hand. <laughs> and I got the show, and there it was. 1997, doing The Price is Right in Spanish, and then The Family Feud. So it's, it's really interesting. I ended up hosting the two shows I liked the most as a kid. So literally a dream come true. <laughs> Yeah, what a what a dream, man! What a dream! And I'll tell you what: uh, for us who eat exclusively a plant based diet, you continue to leave the dream because your story is one of the most powerful that has ever been told on the show. That's why I'm so happy that you're here today. So you reach this level of celebrity as the host of these shows. Your stock goes through the roof, and you start getting these endorsements from companies like McDonald's and from Nestle, and then you walk away from those deals. <laughs> Why? I mean, talk to me about this. This is like a sudden change of heart you had. I know. I can write a book, How to Destroy Your Television Career, <laughs> and reset by going vegan. <laughs> I just, it just, it's just called consciousness. It's just consciousness. I, I, I grew up having a lot of, uh, like, when I was raised Catholic, and my mother would tell me about the Bible and Jesus' crucifixion and all of that. And I remember as a kid, I would cry when I would hear or I would see the, the, the images in the church of Jesus being punished. So then uh, later on, I watched movies about slavery and I, I would cry and I would really suffer in my heart when I saw what, what happened to the African people coming to the U.S. or the indigenous people down in, in the New Spain, which is now Mexico and Latin America. Uh, I would suffer seeing that. So when uh, my dear friend Larry Moss, who was my, my, my English speaking coach, uh, was, was coaching me on learning English, he referred me to a couple of videos. One of them was the, the PETA video, the uh, glass walls video. When I watched that and I saw the suffering of the animals, exactly the same thing that happened to me when I, when I learned about Jesus and when I learned about slavery, the same thing happened to me. I saw the animals suffering and being punished. And I and I couldn't take it. I I, I was I, I realized that I was not only 
uh, cooperating with that by consuming the animals, but I was also endorsing big brands on my TV show, on campaigns that were very profitable, of course. Uh, and I, I had a, a spiritual moment and I said, I'm not in this planet. I didn't come here. I didn't receive the, the gifts that I received from God or the universe to promote these things. So I, I, I said, I'm not going to do it anymore. So I switched that. And that was obviously that created uh, a lot of problems in my career because the sponsors are, are those people and uh, I don't have anything against them. I just don't, didn't want to participate. So that was the, the beginning of, of a big change. It's going to be 13 years exactly tomorrow, actually 13 years of, of, of having a plant-based diet. Oh, man. Well, congratulations on the 13th anniversary, man. I didn't know we were going to be celebrating today. That's awesome. Um, so let's, I mean, you, you you said like you joked about how to ruin your career in, in <laughs> such a short time. I mean, talk about the net effect that you did. I mean, that, that must have been a huge sacrifice. Jokes aside, a huge sacrifice for you it, professionally. What was the is. effect? It is because I was, I was, being, I mean, I'm literally, and I, I'm not bragging about it. I'm just saying this because I want people to understand the, the amount of money that is involved in each person that is uh, endorsing these products. I used to make millions of dollars. That was, that's the dream. When you work hard on television, that's the biggest candy you get is the endorsements for, from the big brands. And, and it cost me literally millions of dollars. But I said, I did not come to this uh, life to make the most amount of money. I came here to be centered in my heart and in my loving and in my compassion. And this doesn't sit well with me. I cannot be some, a part of something that my heart really uh, dislikes. And uh, so I, I, I gave it away. And that, I mean, this year I gave up on two shows already because the two shows have to do with, uh, with, with sponsors. And nowadays more and more television wants you to be endorsing the products. One of the shows I didn't do this year is a show I used to do before called Minute to Win It, but we we didn't do it. Someone else is doing it in Mexico because they want me literally to be like, this show is sponsored by so-and-so and, and they want the host to recommend the product. So yeah, it was, it, was a, it was a big change in my career, but even though it has cost me a lot of money, there's something that is priceless and this is having peace inside me and knowing that I'm doing the what's 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 aligned with my heart and and I don't do it now today not only for the animals I do it for my own health I do it for the planet I do it for the workers in the in the in the, in the industry I do it for many reasons and I'm I'm just I'm just happy I mean happiness doesn't come from accumulating the most money possible it comes from following your heart and being congruent with your values and that's what I'm doing <laughs> Well, I'm a, I'm a glass half full kind of guy, and I'm wondering if there's a happy medium here, given the fact that we're seeing such a surge in popularity of plant-based eating. You know, we're seeing things like the Impossible Burger just go through the roof, companies like Gardein, as there are more and more of those major companies that are on board with the idea of eating plant-based. Do you think then that that could, you know, really kind of help balance out the sacrifices that you made with the path that you're on? Well, yes, I had to. That's a, that's a really good point. What I did is I became a professional investor and now I, I'm actually, I'm an investor in Beyond Meat. I invested, I, I belong to uh, uh, two uh, plant-based funds. One is called Plant Power Fund and the other one is Plant Power Fund 2, founded by the, the creators of the Veggie Grill. And, uh, and, and, and I'm an investor in many of the, of the plant-based brands because I've seen how, how much they're growing and I put my money in there. And uh, we're getting really good profits because uh, <laughs> those products are growing and growing and growing. And also I became an entrepreneur. So I have my own company. I have my online uh, personal development uh, academy. Uh, we have around 8,000 students now active in, in, in Mexico. And part of what I teach is uh, what we teach with the help of doctors and nutritionists. We teach about a healthy, healthy eating habits. And uh, we've been doing promotions with Vitamix. And, but it's, this is happening more in the digital world. I think that's where the present and the future is. Television has gotten stuck with big sponsors that are not necessarily the healthiest brands. Hopefully in the future, television will also end up getting sponsors that are more related to the plant-based world. Oh man, as as a, a broadcaster myself, I could I could talk about this with you all all day, but I you know I worry that the audience, their eyes are just kind of glazing over uh, with some of this stuff. Uh, but let's let's have some fun here, man, because I was looking you up before the show, doing a little show prep. I hop over on your Wikipedia page, and it says that you're fifty now. 
it's Wikipedia, so I kind of take Damn. everything with a little bit of a grain of salt. But assuming that you have <laughs> made 50 trips around the sun, how old do you feel? I would imagine that you feel a lot younger than that, given the fact that you are living this healthier lifestyle. If I showed you the picture of the last passport that I had before being vegan 13 years ago, I can, you, and you saw my picture today, I look better today than 13 years ago before being vegan. Before being vegan, I was a heavy carnivore. Not only I would endorse uh, uh, Nestle and and, uh, and McDonald's and those big big sponsors, I was eating a lot of meat. I went into the Atkins diet for about a year. I did the South Beach diet, you know, the low carb, high protein, all of that. I did it for years and I was looking old. I was getting old by, 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 by all means. Uh, Something happened when I went plant-based, not only my health changed so much, but my skin, my eyes, I mean, I haven't lost hair. I do have gray hair, but I I haven't lost my hair. I'm gonna be 50, 51 in December and I don't feel 51 or 50 and I'm doing things that I didn't do before. I, I, I ride my bicycle for, for, for miles. I, I, I'm active. I have high energy. A lot of people tell me, like, how do you have that much event, that much energy? It's like, well, basically, and I mean, I'm sure it has to do with genes too. It's 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 a, it's a lot of elements, but one of them for sure. I mean, a doctor could tell me how much does it have to do with it. But being plant based, I personally think that it has helped me a lot. Well, you talk about being a a heavy carnivore uh, 13 years ago. So compare that to what it is that you're eating today. So, I mean, just something as simple as what did you have for breakfast this morning? What did I have for breakfast this morning? There's a there, I'm, I'm living in Austin, Texas, great city for vegans. And there's a restaurant called Citizen, which I love. And I had an avocado toast that has uh, the just egg, uh, vegan egg on top of it, it was delicious. And that has asparagus and other things. Uh, so I'm like cities like Los Angeles, Austin, San Francisco, New York, Boulder in Colorado. I mean, there's so many places where being vegan is so easy. And uh, so that's I, I eat a very, very balanced diet. My only sin, and I do confess, is that being that there's so many uh, vegan products out there. I have to come back over and over to my veggies and my salads because there's so many temptations out there in the vegan world today that they were not out there 13 years ago that is is very yummy and very dangerous also to have those options back in the market. So it's good news, but you have to be careful. <laughs> All right, let's uh, let's pivot here and let's talk about something more serious that's happening right now. Obviously, that is the, the COVID-19 pandemic. And we do know that the Hispanic community has been hit disproportionately hard by that. In Los Angeles, you know, the latest statistics show that uh, nearly half of all cases, half of all deaths there are made up with the Hispanic community. I mean, just just eye-opening numbers. And it goes to show here, Marco, that really something needs to be done and we can all do better here. Yeah, the, the, that's it's really sad because uh, it comes with poverty. It has to do a lot with poverty. People who have no money end up eating a lot of more junk food because junk food, you know, is, 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 is more accessible, is cheaper. Uh, we know that that has to do a lot with politics because there's there's a lot of subsidies that go to the junk food industry and not to veggies, not to healthy foods. And uh, unfortunately, in our in our culture, it's very common to be eating foods that are just not healthy. And there's a lot of obesity. There's a lot of diabetes. There's a lot of children of the obesity. Mexico is number one in, in, in child obesity right after uh, right before the U.S. And uh, unfortunately, if you, I mean, I, I used to live in Los Angeles. I lived there for like 10 years and I lived in Santa Monica and uh, which is a very privileged area by the ocean, a lot of white people, very little minorities, but I would go very often to East LA to do workshops and conferences. We toured the city one time with, with Mayor Garcetti uh, giving financial freedom uh, workshops for free and crossing Los Angeles from Santa Monica to East LA is a completely different world. It feels like a completely different uh, country itself. You would go into those schools and you would see that most, almost everyone was overweight. Almost everyone was not eating healthy. Almost everyone was feeling sick and taking tons of pills. And it's, it's just a different reality. So the problem is that unfortunately, 
the medical education, the health education, the quality of foods, the, 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 the little exercising uh, that people in the minor in minorities in the U.S. have is so low that obviously they're more sub subjectable to, to, to getting sick when COVID-19 hits. So you just mentioned childhood obesity in Mexico. Adults there, pulling some stats, you know, three quarters are either overweight or obese. We're talking about numbers very similar to here in the U.S. And here in the U.S., the interesting thing is, despite the obesity epidemic, there is still, by and large, this big stigma, this taboo surrounding vegan diets. So when you do speak to members of the Hispanic community, how is that message received? It's received well because it's easier to talk to our people because we have uh, the roots of beans and rice and lentils and plants. You have to remember that before the Spaniards got into what was called the New Spain, then be it became Mexico and Guatemala and Central America and all of that, uh, the, 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 the indigenous uh, ways of eating were basically plant-based, where it was based on beans and lentils and, and, and vegetables. Uh, there's there's a, there's an organization of doctors in Mexico that they're promoting what's called la dieta de la milpa, which means the the crop diet basically, which is going back to our roots. So when you talk to them, it's easier to reconnect them with with their roots. Now, what's not easy is for them to get quality foods, meaning organic foods, getting uh, you know things like Beyond Meat. It's too expensive, like the the processed vegan or plant based options are too expensive definitely for people who have less money. So the, 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 the bridge there has to be built into talking to them about not the processed vegan foods, but going back to the roots, to the le less expensive, which are the healthiest options, the, the whole foods plant-based diet, you know, that is the key. So that's what I focus on because the, the objection always it is, oh, of course, you're rich, you live in Santa Monica or you live in Austin and you have money and I don't have money. And, and when, you, when you share with them that the most natural and, and whole foods are the best for them, and that is the solution, and you teach them that, and you share that with them, that's when you win on, on, on giving that message. Yeah, I, I, I think that that, you know, that whole food, plant-based, whole paycheck kind of notion, kind of, it, it really spans across races, uh, to be honest with you. I remember uh, really opening some eyes when we did an episode on the Exam Room podcast a couple of years ago, where one of our nutritionists, Lee Crosby, and I went downstairs in the office. There's a little boutique grocery store on the ground floor. We filled up an entire cart filled with whole food, plant-based foods there for two people for an entire week. The total grocery bill was just about $40. It was incredible how much food you can actually buy for that money. Yes, yes. I think if you go back to the roots, to the, I mean, beyond that is, it, that's the healthiest thing. When I became vegan and, and uh, 13 years ago, there was no Beyond Meat, there was no Daya Cheese, there was no, none of these Miyoko's and all of these amazing brands that you have today. There's nothing like that. So when I went plant-based, I went vegan, I really went whole foods plant-based meaning I was eating the real, original, natural foods. And that's when my health really excelled. Actually, I had problems later on with all, when all the processed foods, the vegan processed foods came in because I started gaining weight again because I started eating the more expensive processed foods. So I had to go back to my roots, to my original uh, 13 years ago, Marco, which is what I'm doing now, eating again the, the less expensive ones that are the original whole foods, and that's the healthiest, and that's the least expensive. But of course, when you talk about cheese, or you talk about meat, and you talk about the processed foods, vegan substitutes, that's where there's there's a there's a challenge. But you did it. I mean, it, it can be done. And that's, that's exactly what we need to do to be healthier. Dr. Barnard, I want to bring you into the conversation here to help us connect the dots. Mm -hmm. We're talking about obesity, even going so far as talking about, you know, putting on weight when you're eating these highly processed vegan foods. So let's talk about the risk of having a severe COVID-19 infection when you are obese, when you are overweight. Talk to us a little bit about that correlation there. Sure. Uh, having excess weight increases the risk of all kinds of problems, as you know, diabetes, certain cancers are more common. But when COVID-19 came in, one of the first things we saw is that people who were overweight seemed to be more likely to get it and more likely to have really serious problems. And the PCRM doctors who are on the front lines in the hospitals that we talk, that we're talking to all the time say the people they're really having trouble 
getting off the ventilators and getting out of the hospital are the people where they carry excess weight. Part of that is because the fat cells actually express what's called the ACE2 enzyme, which is the welcome mat where the virus use, that the virus uses as a doorway into the body. And so once they're in the fat cells, it looks like the viruses replicate there. So uh, Marco's right. It's a really important thing to, to keep trim as, as much as we can. And if a person isn't trim now, then a healthy vegan diet is going to be the best way to get you there. And Marco, in Mexico, the lawmakers, they are really standing up and taking attention of this obesity epidemic now. For the second time in as many weeks, a state in Mexico, Tabasco now, following Oaxaca and actually banning the sale of junk food, highly processed foods like chips and candy and soda to minors. I mean, that seems like such a, a radical step, but is there a solution there? I mean, is the, are they on to something outlawing that and treating these types of foods and soda just like tobacco? Is, is that the step that we need to take to curb this obesity epidemic? Yeah, I, I mean, I'm, I'm so shocked and amazed in a very positive way that Tabasco and Oaxaca have done that. You're talking about the southeast of Mexico, the south of the southern Mexico area where the most poverty is. Like northern Mexico is way richer. Why? Because it's next to the U.S. and there's all kinds of uh, financial exchanges there. The southern part of Mexico, which is next to Central America, is the one that has always been uh, struggling the most uh, with, with its economy and with its health. Uh, most of the immigrants you see here in the U.S., most of them come from Oaxaca, from Tabasco, from the states in the southern part of it. So that the government there uh, is being brave enough to confront these huge corporations that, as we know, have a lot of power, maybe less than in the U.S., but they do have a lot of power. Confronting them and taking this step is, is a huge step in the right direction. Years ago, uh, they banned uh, these products, junk food products, to be able to advertise on kids' show on television. That was like 10 years ago, and that was also a big step back in the day. But since then, there was a big gap, and nothing huge has happened until now. And I really, really hope that, I mean, Mexico City and the, the, and the whole country follows uh, Tabasco and Oaxaca. I know it's not easy, and I know they're going to get a lot of, a lot of backlash from the, the powerful corporations, but this this has to happen. I mean, there's there's no way you can ask for prosperity in a country where people are badly educated, they don't have good medical attention, and on top of that, they're eating junk food every single day. So if we don't solve those problems in the Mexican culture, in Latin America, we're never going to get ahead. And, and those foods, they are so addictive. They got their hooks in me very early as well. I mean, that eating that stuff in elementary school and then throughout my, my school career, I mean, that's what got me all the way up to 420 pounds at one point. You know, wow. it, it just graduated from potato chips all the way up to a $20 a day Taco Bell habit, you know, taking yeah. in 10,000 calories a day. And it began with those bags of chips yeah. and Doritos and things like that at grandma's house after mm -hmm. school. Um, before, Marco, we talk about the big event tomorrow, I got to ask you about your podcast as well. You're a fellow podcaster. How are things going with Marco? They're going well. We have uh, 130 episodes. We're in hiatus now, coming back with the fifth season in September. We have around 7 million downloads, which is huge for a podcast that talks about physical health, emotional health, healthy things. It's not a gossip talk show. It's not a sports talk show. It's not a comedy talk show. So having a podcast that is about getting better about creating a higher level of consciousness it's it's amazing so what we do in that podcast is 100 percent in spanish we talk about things that help you become financially free things that have to do with your physical health obviously we with a strong emphasis huge emphasis on on on, on a plant-based diet and we also talk about the our emotional health how we treat our emotions how we manage our our, our heads our brains in order to make our own brain our the boys in our heads our 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 ally and not our enemy. So those are the three aspects. For me, it's like a tripod, right? Being more in, emotionally mature, in, intelligent, uh, being also uh, savvy with with the money, learning how to make money, how to how to multiplicate money, how to how to have financial literacy, right? And then the third one is is your diet, is your your physical habits. So that's the focus of the of the podcast. And we're doing great. And uh, it was funny what you what you were saying about growing up eating junk foods. That's exactly what happened to me. Exactly, I grew up eating sausages, 
lots of milk, lots of white bread. And uh, my, my mother used to call me the calf because I would take the gallons of milk and I would drink them like, like water. And surely enough, I mean, my whole family did that. And most of my family has weight problems. And so me breaking, when, when people tell me like, oh, come on, Marco, don't be so exaggerated. Kids need to be happy. What's wrong with them having a little junk food here and there? I think about that when you were saying that, Chuck, the, the greatest gift that I would have been given as a child would have been to not be raised on junk foods because still now, still being vegan now, I still struggle with eating junk foods. Now they're vegan, but they're still junk food. So the best thing, the best gift you can give to a, to a little kid from my perspective is to teach them and develop their palate to like healthy foods versus sugary uh, processed foods. You know, that's so I, I resonate with you on that. Oh man, I could talk to you all day about that. I mean, you are so spot on. I honestly, and and this is just me talking, not not the organization, oh, but yeah. just me. I honestly do agree that things like the chips, candy bars, sodas, they should be viewed in the very same light as tobacco, knowing what we yeah. do about their addictive properties. They're one and the same, and they'll kill you at about the same speed. So you know, go figure. Um, let's talk about something a little bit more positive. Tomorrow, uh, there is a big one day, one stop shop for all things going vegan for the Hispanic community. You're taking a, a big role in this Mas Plantas Mas Salud. And by the way, you can register right now at, uh, you see the web address on there, Comite de Medicos.org uh, or PCRM.org if you want to head over there as well to register. Uh, Marco, talk to us a little bit about this event and what it is you're going to be speaking about. I think it's gonna be a very, very beautiful, wonderful event because we're gonna be empowering the community with things that are based on the experience of others following a plant-based diet, based on science, based on, on a lot of a lot of good and, and information that is real, that is that is based on science that can help you turn around and say, listen, I, I can I can decide to have a healthier life. I can decide on the quality of my life for the future. I I, I said goodbye to my mother three years ago. She she passed uh, in 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 at she was 80 years old, but for the last 15 years of her life, she struggled with obesity, she struggled with type 2 diabetes, she struggled with Alzheimer's. So I saw the last 15 years of her life being really, really miserable. And that's something I don't want for myself and I don't want from anyone. And the fact that you can switch or, or lower the possibilities of getting those diseases and having a higher quality of life towards your adult livelihood and towards the end of your life, it's in our hands. And that's something that this event tomorrow is going to be very helpful at. It's going to be just giving you uh, tools and culture and education. And what I'm going to be sharing is, is how and what happened to me when I went from being a heavy, heavy carnivore to being a, 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 pl a plant-based, uh, uh, you know, fanatic, I can say it, because I really, really love plant-based foods. I, I, I used to have diabetes, not diabetes, I'm sorry. I used to have gastritis, esophagitis, and colitis, level three. And all of that went away when I did it. Obviously, I'm not a doctor. I'm not a nutritionist. That happened to me doesn't mean that it's science. is going to happen for everyone. But I'm going to share my per personal experience uh, on switching from heavy carnivore to plant-based and from endorsing basically McDonald's and Nestle to be a friend of PCRM and other organizations and endorsing a plant-based diet. It's so cool to me how so many people will adopt a plant-based diet initially just to lose weight. And then they find that everything else kind of clicks into place. You were just talking about all of your conditions clearing up. And, and then your mom with the Alzheimer's and, and how a plant-based diet can really help lower your risk of that as well. It, it's really mm -hmm. tremendous. So uh, on the program tomorrow, you're going to be learning the basics of cooking a plant-based meal. You're going to learn about the connection between COVID-19 and these diseases that we were just talking about and the foods that you're eating and how just changing one meal at a time can dramatically improve your health over the long term. We're talking about one meal at a time, not this dramatic overnight change. Just start with one meal and see what happens. Uh, Marco, man, I can't let you go uh, before dipping into your old game show persona, man. Uh, <laughs> I would love it. I would be so grateful if you could just give us like a 15, 20 second promo for the event tomorrow in Spanish. That would be, that would just make my weekend, man. In Spanish. <laughs> in Spanish. In Spanish. 
Okay, so let, show me the, the the link where they can where they can when they can uh, subscribe. And so in Spanish, lo soy Marco Antonio Regil. Los quiero invitar a que vayan ahora mismo a comité de médicos .org y se suscriban a este evento gratuito donde van a poder aprender los grandes beneficios de vivir una vida basada en plantas por su salud, por el planeta, por los animales, por todos. Así que los esperamos. Comité de médicos .org, suscríbanse. There you go. <laughs> my man, my man. I think I got about every fourth word, but uh, that, that was just fantastic. Uh, thank you so very much for your time. I would love to have you back on the program again in the future, my friend. We'd love to be here. Thank you so much for everything you do. Love PCRM and it's, it's amazing what you guys are doing. Thank you. You're a good man. Give him a follow on Instagram at Marco Antonio Rahil or check out his podcast, Marco. That's on Apple Podcasts and all major podcast providers. All right. Time now really quickly to get caught up on the latest happenings. Here are your health headlines for Friday, August 21st, 2020. We do start with the coronavirus by the numbers as more than 44,000 new cases were announced in the U.S. while 1,100 people died on Thursday. And as we prepare to wrap up this week, we are still more than 2 million cases ahead of the next hardest hit country of Brazil. And tomorrow is World Plant Milk Day. And what you're looking at right there is some of the finest milk that soy has to offer. So ahead of the big day, a leading nutritionist in the UK is saying that getting rid of dairy in schools could help curb Europe's obesity crisis. Leila Degan Zalaki points to high levels of saturated fat that are found in milk and in cheese. And she tells Maria Coronado of Plant Based News that the fat is often overlooked because many studies that are cited are actually funded by the dairy industry. Where have you heard that before? And UK taxpayers, by the way, pay about 7 million pounds or roughly 9 million US dollars every year to subsidize dairy milk for children. And by the way, Maria and Plant Based News, thank you guys for all of your support of the show. And finally, in other news, in what is considered to be the most comprehensive study of COVID-19 and children to date, it appears that kids may carry higher levels of the virus than adults, meaning that they play a larger role in the spread of COVID-19 than we previously thought. In a study of children under the age of 22, many of those who tested positive were shown to have, quote, extremely high levels of the virus in their airway. And those higher concentrations can make it easier for them to pass it on to others, including to adults with pre-existing conditions who are at higher risk for infections. Dr. Barnard, I want to bring you into the show here to talk a little bit more about this. The researchers in this study say that this carries with it great implications as schools, K through 12, colleges open their doors this fall, some of them already reverting back to virtual learning because of outbreaks in the classrooms. What is your big takeaway from this study? It's a huge issue. Um, can I share my screen with you? T tell, me if you can, tell me if you can see this. I'm trying to show. I got it, my friend. Got, okay, children as sources of COVID-19. Uh, I want to give the details of the study that you actually just mentioned. It was at Mass General Hospital, huge hospital, obviously. Uh, they looked at 192 kids who came in, they all had COVID-19. Now, first of all, they had lower expression of the ACE2 receptor. That's that welcome mat uh, that we were talking about with Marco being on the fat cells. And the kids had less of it. So you'd think, all right, they're gonna be fine. The virus won't get in their body so much. They're gonna re recover more quickly. And it's true that generally their clinical course is much better than for adults. Mortality is less. However, they actually measured the, the load of the virus in their nose, in their mouths and so forth. And what, what they found is that the viral load was highest on the first two days of symptoms and substantially higher in the kids than in adults, meaning the children are unfortunately viral fountains that are, that, who are spreading it. So the practical application of this is parents, uh, teachers, principals, school nurses who say, I'm kind of nervous about having all these kids around, me around each other spreading the virus. Uh, the data are in and kids do spread it. Regardless of whether or not they're showing any symptoms themselves. But what we do know is that if a child is overweight, just like an adult, they're at higher risk of becoming symptomatic. And just as that nutritionist in the UK was pointing out, a great way to help curb that obesity epidemic would be to get that dairy milk out of schools. Yeah, absolutely. Um, when we talk about junk food, keep in mind the junk food category isn't just potato chips and candy. Junk food should include cheese, milk, 
meat, eggs. These are things that are not needed. They don't have the nutrition kids need. Uh, they should get out of, the, out of the diet, out of the schools. If they would, would do that, kids would be less likely to dip into obesity. They'd be more likely to stay healthy. And that helps them lifelong in addition to helping over the short run against COVID-19. All right. Time now to open up the doctor's mailbag. Dr. Barnard, time now to prescribe an answer to this question. It comes to us from Cold Cuts with a Z. Uh, I hope those are vegan cold cuts. Anyway, Cold Cuts wants to know, have there been other viruses besides the flu that have the non-lasting immunity problem? This goes back to a conversation you and I were having on Wednesday show. Okay. Yes. Um, in, in fact, I think we're going to, I want to talk with you more about this in the next show as well, because I've got some tips about flu vaccines and things I'd like to share. But for now, you're right. Uh, you get an influenza shot, you get the flu shot, and sometimes it doesn't work at all. And even in the best of cases, it doesn't last very long. Sometimes it doesn't work at all if they hit the wrong virus. But are there other viruses as well for which we have no vaccine? Absolutely, most of them. Uh, when was the last time your doctor said, I've got a vaccine against colds? Uh, Okay, there isn't one, it's not gonna happen. Um, but what is of particular concern is that when we look at other coronaviruses, 2002, the SARS epidemic uh, arrived and researchers tried to make uh, an anti-SARS vaccine and it was a real struggle. And then in 2012, 2012, 2013, 2014, MERS, the Middle Eastern Rep uh, Res Respiratory Syndrome came in. Um, bad pandemic for, or bad epidemic for a while, couldn't make a, a decent vaccine for it. And the concern is that the coronaviruses in particular are really technically challenging when it comes to getting immunity from a vaccine. So now we've got SARS-CoV-2, the, the COVID-19 virus. Hopefully we'll get a vaccine uh, to it. There are pretty clever people working on it right now, but it remains to be seen. All right. If we didn't get to your question today, have no fear. We will save it and try to get you an episode, uh, get you an answer on an upcoming episode, I should say, or you can still tweet them to us as well using the hashtag exam room live. Dr. Barnard, appreciate your time today, my friend. Sure. Thank you, Chuck. And thanks to Marco for joining us. Yeah. Such a great guest. Oh. Really just an extraordinary guest. Yeah. And, and such a great friend. And, and when we decided to launch into this wonderful Spanish language program, which is happening tomorrow, we didn't have to ask Marco twice. He's jumping in and he's helping out and he's going to change people's lives. So hats off to Marco. Looking forward to that. So go ahead and register for that program now. There is still time. It begins at noon Eastern tomorrow afternoon. Uh, real quick, don't forget that you can, you see the web address right there on the screen. Go ahead and register right now. Uh, don't forget also, you can take control of your health and put everything that you've learned about on the show here today and all week and all month long here. You can put that into practice for yourself by scheduling an appointment at the Barnard Medical Center with any one of the doctors and, and dietitians there. We're talking about preventative medicine here, talking about going on the offensive with your health and not just sitting back and, and continuing to eat this unhealthy diet and waiting for these diseases to come to you. No, it's about going on the offensive, putting food first, putting nutrition on the pedestal where it belongs and living the healthiest life that you possibly can. So if you want to make your appointment with our doctors and dietitians, you can do that right now by visiting barnardmedical.org, or you can pick up the phone and call 202-527-7500 to make that telephone medicine appointment. And again, telemed appointments are available in more than a quarter of the country already. So go ahead. You can see a full list of locations at barnardmedical.org where you can also schedule that appointment. And that is going to do it for us today and for this week here on the exam room live. Appreciate everyone who has tuned in today. And I greatly appreciate the dedicated staff working in the background to make this production happen. The exam room live, you guys are tremendous. And everyone who tunes in every day, I mean, I'm gonna call you guys our, our dailies, the the exam roomies. That's the that's the name that I'm gonna give you guys. And we're talking about Allison Mahoney and Baal and Michael Askew, Karen Roller Girl. I don't know your real name, but Roller Girl, I appreciate you watching us every day. It, from the bottom of my heart, just thank you so much for being here and uh, keeping the chat box chatty. You guys are the best. And thank you as well for tuning in today. We'll talk to you again on Monday. Until then, have a phenomenal weekend. Thank you again to Marco Antonio Raheel. And on behalf of everyone here at the Physicians Committee, I am the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll. Have yourself a great weekend. And remember, stay safe take a stand, and keep it plant-based.